Yeah, I don't go live on Facebook as much, so I'm like, what am I looking at? Oh, is that where that's happening or on YouTube? This one is going live on Facebook. I'll oh, cool. record it and then upload it to YouTube. So let me get us Okay, well, I'll share it then from your Facebook to my Facebook. Okay, perfect. So... And I see your recording, so you just edit this out later. Well, it's already live. It's out. <laughs> we're, oh, we're live now. Yeah, we're on right now. I'm Surprise. just kind of <laughs> getting our title in here and breathing on the internet. Oh wait, no, we're not live yet. You have to oh. type all that title and stuff, and then hit live. Oh, good. Yeah. Because I tell you what, on YouTube they are like, there's no grace they're just like you so even life. while you're typing and all that stuff you're alive yes you, you just sit there and breathe okay we're gonna oh i see it we're gonna go live right now okay okay <laughs> yeah no you type so i'm like trying to make sidebar conversation as i'm typing all that stuff out on youtube because there's well, no grace now we're live stormy and okay. there is grace because stormy <laughs> grace look at that that's why i have to bring the grace everywhere i go because that's how damn bad i need it that's all I'm saying. And the world and the world needs more grace now. So we're very grateful for you. Thank you. Well, I'm pumped to have you here for sure. You're back. We've done this one time before and, and you're back, which I'm pumped to have you. So thank you for showing up and being ready to talk about what's next, which I think is so nice, actually, that you brought the topic up because it is a time where I'm finding and I don't know about you, but I'm finding people are kind of tired. We're kind of tired. So it's like, I need, I need a view of maybe what's next. When do things shift? What can, what can I expect? Even in the upcoming months, like 2021 is what I'm excited about, but even in the next coming months and in the next coming cycle, you know, maybe just some light. Yeah. I mean, I think astrology offers so much, right? Like it can really help us keep the faith it can have us go in the exact opposite way. In fact, its leanings are more towards, I think, fear if we're not careful with it, right? Sure. Um, and it's been used that way too much, that's for sure. And I really like to say astrology should be a way in, not a way out, right? So when I reached out to you um, and said, hey, let's connect again, you said, well, what's the subject? I'm like, I don't know. All right, well, yeah, let's talk about when does it all end? Which is actually one of my least favorite questions as an astrological counselor. We hear this all the time, right? It's like, when does this end? When is it going to get better? And truthfully, sometimes it's just really helpful to say, like, look, by next February, things are going to feel much lighter for you, right? But I think that also promotes, like, escape from the initiation and really missing the opportunity. You know, like, I think the worst thing than a transit or progression or perfection, whatever it's gonna be like really happening to you. I think we wanna happen with it, right? But missing the boat altogether, that's just the worst, right? So yeah, yeah. as a counselor, it's always, look, it doesn't get better, you get you better. get better, right? Right, and then you don't really want it to because you appreciate like that this is the time of the great shift. But when we're speaking about this culturally, globally, whatever, it can also be nice to kind of Fast forward the, the astro clocks a little bit and see what's to come, yeah? Yeah, I absolutely agree. It is, it is just genuinely a hard question because it gets real esoteric real fast as soon as you ask it because it's like there's just a lot in the middle and the meat of that. So we actually had an eat and greet this morning with Achuta Baba and he talked about mystical, the mystical Saturn, which I loved um, to not only present a different um, tone of Saturn and how we can think about it and interact with it, things that it can mean, but that there's actually like an esoteric view of Saturn as well, not just this big jerk in the sky trying to make life hard, essentially just all the limits and lessons. So I think it leads beautifully into, you know, everything we're going to talk about today and kind of give a view because when does it get better? Well, it's going to get different, not 
too long from now. We've got just a few months before Saturn is going to shift into Aquarius, and that's going to bring some different. That's going to bring maybe what feels like relief because it's just not in the Capricorn energy, but it could be a new stress as well. Right? My experience is when Saturn steps into a new sign, just like it did back in March, it gives us an immediate view of what's not working here. And that can be shocking. That can be stressful. That can be all of those things. But it's different. Right? It is certainly different. different. <laughs> Don't worry. It's a, it's a different pain. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> it's a mystical purpose, right? Like uh, some images of Saturn, right? It's like this wall to push against to get stronger until we're ready for the breakthrough. Or... I often speak about Saturn, like the rings as this rubber band and you got to put the work in. It's got to get tense. You know, if you want to fire that thing across the room further than you could ever throw it. Right. There's a lot of mastery and, and engagement with that. And, you know, this is part of the earth game. It, it's interesting that Saturn, who's, you know, that slowest moving visible light, right? Like that grandmother time vibe it's like it's so close to the earth it all it's that taurus it brings us back in and that agriculture and that take your time with it in the cycles and um but yeah i mean i think a lot of what it feels like in in the plane of matter is that we have the opportunity here with the appearance of space and time to grow and oftentimes our greatest growth comes from having something to push against a little bit and but having an awareness of what that is is so important yeah like we've all been calling for the shift and i think in in client work or when i'm you know looking at my own chart and the in the shape of the time now and what's to come it's like well how can i bring all of myself to this what do the planets want from you like what are they willing to offer me how will they help me grow and, you know, sometimes it really is about doing the work. And it, sometimes it feels like, you know, like, so my partner, Anna's five-year-old boy has been in, in the ICU. He spent 15 nights in the hospital. It was terrifying. And he's now out and he's great. And, you know, and I can see it in his chart in a big way. Actually, I, I didn't share with her. I was looking at his solar return chart and some of the stuff earlier this year. He's like, oof, like, this looks really rough. Um, and this guy, like this young guy, he seems to have astrologically scheduled a lot of like his, some of the heavier initiations in life really early on. Yeah, he right? has so stuff like, to do later. <laughs> right, it's like, dude, courageous soul, but kind of wise, right? But I think, you know, it's, it's not like he's not going to come into it again. Some of it's me looking through like his annual perfections and that's a 12 year scene, right? But that doesn't mean every 12 years he ends up in the hospital. In some ways, I think, it's not about checking the box, but if we really meet the energy and grow through it, right? The next time it comes around, it's going to be, an, it's not on that circle. It's on the spiral. It's on the next level. So some of this is like, when does it get better? When we get better, like literally when we listen and when we make that shift. So we've all been calling for a change. Like, you know, what's the new normal? Well, the old normal was not normal at all. Sure. Right. It was accepted. And, yeah. So, I mean, interesting, you speak about Saturn coming into Capricorn. What about when Pluto came into Capricorn in 2008 and there was this whole global financial crisis and then sadly this giant bailout, right? I mean, what if instead of bailing out the bankers, we chose to just completely destroy that false system of fiat currency and then wouldn't this Jupiter, Saturn, Pluto and Capricorn offer us some different juice like a different kind of reward for doing the the mm -hmm. the evolution that was like the opportunity was offered to us then but where have you been in your own life like i'm a totally different dude than i was in 2008 hopefully that's true for everybody yeah oh i am i am there's still a lot of color but there's a lot more <laughs> there's a lot more substance thank god Right, like in your experience in your life, yes, it's just a, a lot different. And you know, my um, Capricorn owns my fifth house in my chart in Placidus, anyways. And so, my children are extremely different people than they were at that time, too. And by proxy, we've grown together. So, it's like you know, having that very outward other human beings to even kind of measure what that's looked like there are mm -hmm. leaps and bounds of different there in how i practice and how i show up in my life all of these things have gone through that evolution and shift 
and there was some damn hard work that came with it and i'm really seeing it this year which is neat i think that's incredibly neat beautiful um i was just contemplating a capricorn as the fifth chart <laughs> can i share my screen yes um, oh hold on let me make you close so you can okay there you go uh, I have permission. You have, have been granted. <laughs> um, yeah, so one thing that I've been looking at is that we often speak about these cycles of time and development, you know. Today, like I'll get to see this beautiful thing, which is that Diana's bow, right? Like the, the, the crescent moon reborn out of the shadow of the sun's light. You know, there's all these prophecies of three days of darkness. And for our experience of the moon, that comes true every month, right? The day before and the day of and the day after new moon, because unless moon occults the solar disk for eclipse, new moon is no moon. We have no view of the moon. It's so cool that when planets get so close to the light, we go blind to their experience, right? And so like Rosh Hashanah is happening uh, yes. because that's tuned to new moons are the visible appearance of what we like to call diana's bow the maiden moon as diana the goddess of the moon fires arrows at her brother apollo who is set below right and in that calendar system every day begins at sunset which seems totally backwards but if you're marking the first day of your month with this appearance of the moon which has to happen in the sunset sky then every day starts at sunset and i actually think that, and this is theory, I have no idea, but I think that the Hebrew calendar is tuned so that new year is Northern Hemisphere, Jerusalem, like tuned to um, autumnal equinox, like around this time, sure. because that's the sunset of the year, right? Yeah. So this happens on all levels. So part of the like, oh, when do new things begin? It really has that feeling, mm -hmm. right? So right now, this year, of course, we know jupiter saturn conjunction coming up right so we're actually still at the end of that cycle because the seed hasn't been planted but we did have our saturn pluto in january right so we're in the newness of that thing but it you know the new moon in so many ways is no moon it takes a little while before she she gets far enough away to reflect some visible light to our face sure um, but it's neat too to consider today even you know in the question of when do things get better this is a great day to consider in our personal lives what we can do what we can let fall fall away there's a little struggle to be newly enterprising but there is relief in some of the fall away of what the new moon just showed us as we're moving into that through that crescent phase don't you think where it's like oh, if you're feeling totally. out of sorts over here it's all right to put that down and analyze if that's the right alignment or if you're in the right alignment of service to that area of your life, because maybe that's the thing you put down and you actually get some immediate relief. Do it. Yeah. And so those cycles and seasons, right? So when does it get better, right? Like when are we on the other side of this? When the sun rises tomorrow, <laughs> when does this <laughs> Right? In a few days when the sun ingresses Libra and that's the end of the summer or the end of the winter, depending where you are, right? When does, when's the new beginning? Right now, the new moon. So it's really beautiful to tune into these cycles of day and night or of waxing and waning of the seasons because, and that's this, you know, that's really what I think astrology offers us is this cyclical consciousness. So we know it's not just you go from here to there, it's cycles of time. So this is the reason why I was contemplating Capricorn as the fifth, like literally right, right before we began, I was looking at this Uranus-Pluto conjunction chart, right? So three times between the years of 65 and 66, Uranus and Pluto met in the sign of Virgo. And I mean, this really feels like it was a lot to do with the 60s, right? I mean, I think tuning into Virgo right now, obviously we just had our Virgo new moon of the year yesterday. Um, and I know you're leading the Virgo lunation for astrology hub right now, Stormy. So mm -hmm. I imagine every month you're talking about what kind of seeds do we plant with a new moon and such. But this time was probably even more to say and more peeps to yeah. say it to in some senses. So let me just put this away and let's talk Virgo for a second. What, what did you share with us about 
setting Virgo intentions for this lunation? Yeah, so my big thing around Virgo time is especially Virgo being um, an earth sign and being more in that material plane, the flexible um, material, is the idea of healing through practical reasoning at this time. And I love that because it's almost this idea of progress, not perfection, but we do need to progress, right? Like we do need to continue to move forward, but how? How do we do that? One step at a time, looking at what's the priority. And that is what Virgo is phenomenal about that, that level of pure discernment. Like genuinely, when I think of the Virgin and that energy, I'm like, it's just pure. It's just pure discernment. It, there's no real attachment to it being one way or the other, just pure discernment. And what's so great about that in what I was saying before too, is it's like the truth will set you free. Mm -hmm. This is my priority. This is where I can actually make progress. This is where, you know, I'm stuck. Now I took it all the way back to, to just looking at the Leo new moon that we had, which was about what's my own special sauce. I'm not doing it. I get to the Pisces full moon. I'm struggling to find that. And Pisces shows me again where I'm suffering because I'm not in service to some area of my life. I'm not in the right alignment to it. And Virgo's like, it's cool. I'll show you the priority to get that into alignment in a very material way, I feel like, but it requires a crap ton of flexibility of reasoning. And this is where the healing gets to come. So that's where I'm tracking it through as, as the Virgo time frame and celebrating progress that we've already made, right? Because it is a heavy year when you've done nothing right, or you've done nothing that's been wonderful, or you've done nothing that deserves celebration. That's a heavy year, I think. And humans, man, we got the human condition to deal with. We can do that. We can get so mired in the it doesn't look like what I think it should be. It's not perfect that we forget the progress that's happened. So that's where I'm tracking us. Yeah. We forward. can do that. And that's a choice, right? You can also put mm -hmm. your hand on your heart and think about where you were four years ago, four months ago, four days ago. Sure. Right? And these yeah. things happen in waves. So the four day answer might be, wow, I was really on there four months or whatever. But yes. you will see you're on a course of awakening mm -hmm. or weirdening if you're tuning into this, I'm sure. Yeah. And you know you are climbing from where you once were and it's really important yeah for us to put our hands on our heart and give us some light i mean i think there's a lot of leo in that and um mm -hmm. i would like to say like you know in, in traditional aspect theory as we know signs cannot see their neighbors right and that's a really beautiful study of polarity and so leo's goal is not virgo it's libra mm -hmm. right i mean just think about it. like if i want to grab this thing and like you know like that has it's creative it's inspired but it wants ears like yeah. that thing is just noise unless ears hear it so that artist being right it it is inspired life as art creative for me that's like the leo thing but its goal is libra like the saxophonist needs somebody who wants to listen to a saxophone. Mm -hmm. like that, that's yeah, just, as creative as you want if you're the only one that sees it. <laughs> totally. Like that moon that I just showed a picture of, I took that photo, like she wanted to be photographed. You know what I mean? There's like that in that Libra gift, I think it is really where, you know, I can say that saxophone needs a saxophonist. Mm -hmm. And like that thing's been sitting here. I had no idea I was going to pick it up and play, but that happened. There's a third thing that's necessary that you need the saxophonist, you need the saxophone and you need this need to create in the moment. That's like, that's the three, you know, and it comes into form. It, it comes into matter. The four is the noise, yeah. but the five is sound. And that's like what your ears do with that. It's going to be very different than anybody. Everybody was just shocked. Like what the heck's he doing? Uh, and that's probably too loud and distorted or whatever. But no, trust you know, me, everybody loves it. They're like, yay, bread. Right. But what our ears do to a noise, that's going to be very specific to who you are. That for me is what sound is, you know, like, so the noise of Saturn can join Jupiter on December 21st, 2020. It's going to be a different kind of sound for you than it is for me. And one of the great gifts of this art of the chart that you and I study, right, and, and practice is having some awareness of where in somebody's life that Jupiter Saturn energy is more likely to show, right? I mean, for you, 
if it's like sixth sign stuff, right? Are you Virgo rising? Mm -hmm. Are you talking about Capricorn? Right. So six sign stuff. So what's, what's alive there? We say health and wellness and oh my gosh, like what's it going to be, right? And for me, I'm Gemini rising. And so that's going down in the ninth, right? Um, and so how and what, but it's squaring my sun. It's opposite my Saturn. So we can already see, well, oh, those ears are going to experience that noise exactly. likely in this kind of way or whatever. Yeah. Um, but anyway, what I mean to say is like, Leo is just this inspired creative gift. It really is, I think, remembering that we are divine and we are here to create and claiming Prometheus's fire, you know? And it really, I think, wants Libra. Like, again, the music needs ears to do right. that. But Virgo in between says, cool, polish the stone. Mm -hmm. right, you can do anything you want to do. Glad to hear it. What's it going to be? <laughs> And you might want to learn to play a few scales or something. So before you get to the stage, right. people are just running away, right? Yeah, so you're not just holding a saxophone, right? Like there's a little something you can do with that bad boy. Right, I mean, or even worse, like, oh, <laughs> you know, doing all that thing. And then it's just like, hey, where are you guys going? Um, but so Virgo is this really beautiful gift in that regard of polishing the stone of purifying, of practice makes perfect. Of course, we can do that energy until the inspired artist never finds the stage because we just never think we're good enough. I mean, how many astrologers, aspiring astrologers do you and I teach, I'm sure, where it's like, I'm not ready yet. I, I need to master astrology. It's like, well, that's laughable. Right, you're all good, <laughs> good luck. Right, you can't master this thing. So hopefully that releases some of the weight. But yeah, that purity, that virginity, I, I like to say with Virgo, independence, like reclaiming our self, mm. right? And so learning that, oh, okay, like factory food's not so good for me. What if I plant a garden, right? Learning, oh, wait, I wasn't educated. I was programmed in many regards. What if I learned to learn right and what do i love to learn and you know that kind of thing kind of and i think this is a really important time in that regard i love that yesterday's virgo new moon had such a perfect partile trine yeah that capricorn saturn who's retrograde he's kind of like look at back at the old ways that we used to do this structure exactly right Right. And How that's a new course. daily routine. Let's look at what you've been doing and thinking about every day. Because what you're thinking about is translating into your body as, as you're putting it out bigger than your body. What are you doing in a day-to-day -day mundane way? I loved that, that trying as well. I was like, long range changes. <laughs> Yeah, and yeah, so that day-to-day, -day, right, is the thing we say about Virgo or say about the sixth place. And it really is what's sacred, you know, your diet. Mm -hmm. It's not just about what substance you're putting in your mouth, you know. What are you choosing to watch? What are you choosing to tune into? Not only on the TV screen, but in, like, your own fear set and having some discernment around that, right? Mm -hmm. So I can freak out like for me there's a lot of dystopian nightmares on playing on like this screen of my smoke-filled sky here in california right now. and i can choose to watch that until i'm just like you know shivering in a puddle of my own fear goo and sometimes i do frankly mm -hmm. or i can choose to just kind of turn that channel and you know go be in a place of love and, and bettering myself for a better world yeah, which is, again, like you said, it's really like dependent on where you're at because progress is your progress. We only weigh it against your progress. You know, my progress, I'm in a Pluto, Pluto situation this year. My progress looks way different than someone else who is not. You know what I mean? So what that looks like in that very mundane way, I think the neat part about it is no matter what it is, Virgo being a, an earth sign is asking for some material movement or it's like in a very you can touch it lick it taste it kind of way let's let's do work here and that's that speaks to our when does it get better well right now 
Yeah. You're ready. <laughs> it'll be, be better in an hour if you choose to do that thing that you've been avoiding which you just know on the other side of it, it looks wonderful or whatever and making this a practice i do think that this yeah. is a month where we want to have we want to practice our practices know what it's worth and you know that um that taurus virgo capricorn like earth you know triangle like the body the senses ma matter matters we're here for a reason. <laughs> matter matters. Matter matters. I ask this to people like, what are we doing here? And they say, oh, to get back to source. And it's like, well, why'd you leave? I know. You'd be up there doing, you'd living your best life, giving back to source. You gotta do I, some I, shit while you're that, here. That one doesn't logically compute to me that you came to earth to get back to source. Why leave in the first place? Yeah. I'm with you. And I mean, I think the answer is growth. And I think that these earth signs really, you know, as far as doing this in this world, it resonates and it's beautiful. And these trines exist not only between signs, but between houses, right? So that mm -hmm. kind of second, fifth, um, <clears throat> tenth, or sorry, it's two, six, ten, right? I was like, or Taurus, Virgo, Capricorn, but in your house systems like that, two, six, ten, it really is. It can be many things like two on like lower level. It's like my money, my Reese, I need money. So six, I'm going to go like toil away at some daily job. Tenth, that, you know, is my job. So I get paid and you're just stuck on this loop. Trines don't mean great and easy. Like sometimes easy energy is flowing between things that aren't you and don't work so well, right? On a whole nother level, right? The sixth, I think, really can be the why I do what I do, my sacred work. For me, um, in the shamanic astrology mystery school where I got my start, um, and it's certainly not only there, but I love this identification or association archetypally between the sign of Virgo and the priestess. And this idea that it is your sacred work. Yeah. And that is really an undependent thing. Like what is the way that you connect to spirit that really should be yours and yours alone in some mm -hmm. senses. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, and then that why I do what I do leads me in a sense to what I do in vocation that feeds instead of money and it can, but now value that essence of the second, you know, where I know who I am and that feeds the why I do the what and all that, you know, but if you're Virgo rising, as um, I, this chart that I've cast, then it's a one, five, nine situation of the earth signs. Yes. <laughs> right. And so this time, because again, I was just like looking at some of these cycles of Uranus and Pluto in this example, who it says 150 years here, but they really come together between 130 and 170 years anything Pluto is not too regular. His orbit is so erratic and elliptical, eccentric, but and not like running around the Zodiac anyway. You they're know? pretty slow. He's, right. <laughs> but that's a pretty long chunk of time, right? Yeah. Like I wasn't around for this one and I won't be around for the next one in this vessel. Right? Yeah. But, I, but this was a seed that was planted. And I now live in the Bay where this thing was sprouting, you know, in a huge way or seeded in a huge way. I mean, it's like summer of love coming up after this time and mm. the anti-war movement, the civil rights act, right? There's a lot that we look at in the sixties. And I think right now we really should look to the sixties of how ch serious changes were made. And then how also things seem to kind of get, shut down in some senses like the anti-war movement became sex drugs and rock and rolls and it was too out there for the squares and so it kind of fizzled out you know yeah. but um one way that we kind of look to these explorations right is to say okay well if uranus and pluto planted a seed in virgo right then i think part of that idea of virginity too it was like i get to take back my relationship to my body to my earth i get to do what i want to do there's a lot of this kind of anti-government thing that was going on. Uh, I love the Beatles, the Sergeant Peppers as a great example of this, because they were like, look, 
we're not going to put out a single every week to pad the record labels pockets. Like we're going to, we're going to go make a concept album. And they're like, what's that? It's like, show you in a year. You know, and they yeah, we'll be back. So I, of a, all of us astrologers recently were talking about this seed kind of sprouting in the time when Uranus squared Pluto. And that happened actually seven times between the years of 2012 and 2015. And we could see a, a lot of similarities in the shape of what was happening then. I'm gonna go to this 20, yeah, I'll do this 2014 one. We can go to any of them. But so Uranus then in Aries, squaring Pluto who is then in Capricorn. And um, that square, right, like this would be equivalent to the waxing half moon. And a cool thing to see, like even right now, right, we've got um, these late degree new moons. Yeah. So that Virgo new moon is not going to have a Pisces full moon. By the time the moon is full, the sun will have moved into the sign of Libra. And so it's an Aries new moon. And in fact, even before the moon is at the waxing half at the opening square of the cycle, sun's in Libra. So most of the cycle is going to reflect that light of balance and other ship. I actually think it's a really cool timing to say, right, so as I seek some virginity and kind of reclaim and purify who I am and myself and align to my sacred work, that prepares me to engage with harmonic relationship sure so I'm bringing myself and not just getting lost to the need to be completed yeah yeah well it's like the factory reset is is on the way <laughs> right and i don't know who at this point in the year couldn't use a little of that to just make sure the programming is all set so you're moving forward in that that balanced way but it's balanced i think between ourselves and whatever that we call source whatever that flow is to know if i'm in it or out of it because I get thrown off during the year and I'm like, all the meditation in the world hasn't vibrated me back to my original factory setting. And then I get this chance during the year to just go zoop. Oh, here's all the priorities. Take those out, reset, and then I can move into that flow and with the flow. A lot better. Yeah. But what, so what is the original factory setting? Because are we trying to get back to what we were when we first came in? Or no, so. you know, honestly, what I think the original factory setting is, is for wherever we're at in that particular phase of our development, right? And what it maybe feels like in that very physical earth sign way is my head is calm and I don't, I'm not waking up with low level anxiety and thinking that that's normal. I realize that's fear. Maybe I am not in the right alignment with my life. So I'm taking on or putting out more than as is needed. And that's okay to have that, you know, recognition right now. That's why I think the Virgo, like reclaim your yearly virginity folks. Cause for some people, this is the only time we'll ever get it back. So, you know, really live it this year and get back to what's that pure at home setting that allows us to just really tap that intuitive energy with ease, I think. Right. Yeah. And I think we try to do that culturally, too. I mean, it's mm -hmm. a really challenging time for a lot of certainly challenging time for people who are all alone right now. Mm. Also a challenging time for a lot of people who aren't. Right. So couples are really being initiated, for example, because what used to be OK, see you after work, honey, yeah. now is like you know, battle stationing next to each other, back to back on computer screens, working from home, and it's just together all the time. And now the kids are home and not going to school yes. on their screens, you know, and but we have this opportunity to kind of purify that experience of, hey, we don't love what's happening with the kids in the educational system, but we like that they go there and have friends and we got to do our thing anyway. And now it's like, no, you better learn how to like tune into what we feel mm -hmm. human beings should be learning because you know it starts mm -hmm. at the home and all that so yeah yeah it's a, 
I feel like in this Virgo new moon, Aries full moon, there's a lot of undependence, independence in that name. We're probably going to see a lot of breakups and in, in that kind of thing at this time. But I think we'll also see a lot of harmony again. When we know who we are, when we fill ourselves with our own light, when we do that in so many ways through aligning to what our divine purpose is. Yeah. And it's not the only route, but it's a really powerful route to like become full in such a way that you can come into relationship without that need, that greed of need for relating, which often just kind of destroys it. And, yeah. you know, take this to a, a larger context. Like, what is my relationship to the government and the authorities in that regard? Mm -hmm. What is my relationship to culture, my family, whatever? And I think the Libra time in general teaches us that all is relationship. And it's a really cool time to to come into that truth. And so it's a fun thing to know your chart, of course. And it's fun too, um, Stormy. I didn't looked at yours for a while, but to know that you have Virgo on the rise is this moment. Did I cast this chart for New York City just because it's one of the places that I do I was just looking at maps earlier and I was like, oh okay, this is where Pluto and Uranus were rising during their second conjunction. So if I cast the chart for that place and do whole signs then i'll get to look at these other moments in time like the seven uranus pluto squares between the times of 2012 and 2015 this one's great too because we also had that um tetrad of four total lunar eclipses in a row in that four 2014 15 time but you know when i'm looking at uranus pluto square there's a few ways I want to really look into that. So one, and, and you know, I, I was really, my friend Kent Bai, um, who I actually met at my second ever astrology talk, or it was my first ever talk, but the second night I gave it in Portland instead of Seattle where I was living at the time. And I was talking about the Pluto Uranus square. And Kent at the end of the talk, and it was really nice that he waited until the end and took me aside and he's like, hey buddy, he's like, hey, that's the Uranus-Pluto square. And I was like, what? I was like, wait, if Uranus is Pl squaring Pluto, then Pluto is squaring Uranus, what's the difference? And he's like, speak the name of the faster moving planet first. Yeah. Because when we do, then we open into cyclical consciousness, right? That's, then we can see that a waxing half moon is very different than a waning half moon. They're both squares, but the waxing half moon is the beginning of the cycle as it's moving towards fullness and the waning is the closing of the cycle as it's coming back towards new, right? And so when you say you're in a square Pluto and know that Uranus gets around in 84 years and for Pluto, it's like 250, right? Oh, okay, so since they were aligned in the sign of Virgo in 65, 66, 67, since that time, it took this long for Uranus to square Pluto and it wasn't just like the sun right now moving from Virgo to Libra. It's like, you know, Pluto moved all the way to the trine in Capricorn. And in that time, Uranus moved all the way to Aries. And so, first of all, this would be much more like the fourth house, first house image of a square than the first house, tenth house image. And really importantly, when I look th at this through the lens of the Virgo mysteries where the seed was planted, Oh, it's the way that the eighth squares the fifth. Mm. So that's going to give me a lot more information, right? So I'll say this, there's actually 24 squares in the Zodiac, right? So there's Cancer square Aries and there's Capricorn square Aries. And there's Leo square Taurus and there's Aquarius square Taurus. And we can, you know, so there's every sign has 24 different whole sign squares or every house has 24 different whole sign squares so the idea of why are five and eight square what's the tension there or five and two would be another way right so this is a fun one this is called derived houses are turning the wheel right so your children as you were saying before it's a fifth house so you got all this stuff going down the fifth and so things are going down with the kids but it's also what's the fifth passion, romance, right. creation. Yeah. Because children are the creations of your passionate romance and risks, which is the fifth house too, right? Right, risk. I, that's the thing I think of. I'm like, risk. Whatever you do in the fifth house, you're going to take a risk to get that bad boy going. 
Yeah, and you should. And look, yeah. having a kid is a risk, isn't it? Right? Because everything's going to change in a huge way. And now, now you really got to get food on the table and all that. So I like to say, okay, well, what is the job of the children? Right? So what's the 10th of the fifth house? And you count around, you'll find it's the second house. Uh-huh. So your children's job is to spend your money. Yeah, they're doing a good job. <laughs> but their real job, see, the second is not just your money, right? The second is your values, your worthiness even, even needs. So your children's job is to help you know that you have worth. Mm-hmm. See what I mean? Yeah. yeah. We can always do this. Like what, this is a fun one. What is the, what is the child of my spiritual journey? my ninth house well the fifth of the ninth fifth is children the fifth of the ninth is the first so you are the child of your spiritual study which makes sense right yeah that's so when we look at like these uranus pluto squares who in 2012 2015 would have been in the eighth and fifth signs respectively from virgo where they planted their seed in the 60s You know, the eighth is the fourth of the fifth. The eighth is the fourth of the fifth. You feel me? So let's explore that a little bit. Why fifth, my risks, why does that make a home? Or why is it shelter, fourth house themes? Mm -hmm. Why is it rooted, fourth house themes, in eighth of death and rebirth and well, there, or some say sexuality, right? So my passion, like the home of my passion is my sexuality. The eighth is the fourth of the fifth. That's uh, cool. and so there's a lot of ways to play that. I don't necessarily have answers. And anyway, we're not in that time right now. <laughs> Let's actually go to right now. And just from this perspective of what are Uranus and Pluto up to, when I hit now, we see Uranus, of course, in Taurus and Pluto in Capricorn. And that's the 159 from Virgo, yeah. right? Where we have this kind of esoteric seed. If we're talking Uranus Pluto, if we're talking revolution and evolution, and we ought to be, and we're seeing a lot of it right now. So the square, we say tension, and you get that weird line on the half moon that it kind of feels uncomfortable, like she's a curvy being, like, what's up with that thing? And then we come out of that square and we come into the trine and the moon's bubbling out in gibbous and you get that cosmic egg thing happening. Like it feels good, right? Just naturally looking. (laughs) And of course, Taurus trines Capricorn. And and so this is a really beautiful thing because we see that 159 and this is where Uranus and and Pluto are happening. And um, it's not just Pluto, of course, Saturn, Jupiter and Pluto all in Capricorn at this time, as we well know, whole sign style, that's the fifth of Virgo, as you were saying before, and Uranus is in the ninth, which can be my GED or my college degree, but they traditionally call the house of God. It's your spiritual quest, you know? Yeah. And so, and interestingly, the ninth is the fifth of the fifth. The first is the fifth of the ninth. The fifth is the fifth of the first, right? That's like, that's the triangle thing. It just all gets around in that shape. So there's something really kind of spiritual happening in regards to the seed of the 60s that is happening now. But I think it's asking for us to have a revolutionary, you know, and revelationary is an interesting kind of Uranus thing, like just opening our like uh, ability to receive the messages of something higher and be shocked by it even. And surprised by it but may it help us like root and ground into our passions yeah and, and that being said we don't actually get uranus trining pluto <laughs> in those signs anyway right it's going to be gemini aquarius so this was something i was actually looking at it took me a while to get here when i was contemplating some of the when does it get better well, many were saying that Uranus square Pluto is when does it get worse? <laughs> like, it's like, cause it's just tense and it's revolution and evolution squaring off. And Pluto in that, in that square, that's called the, the Dexter square, right? It's said to be dominating Uranus. And like, 
I don't know. And I mean, it'd be nice to say this thing. I'm not saying we've got to wait till 2026 for to get this to get better, but it's really interesting to see this image and check it out. Neptune, right? It's all, they're all sextile Neptune. So if we had eight hours, I would go back to the Uranus Neptune conjunction of in the, in the year in the Neptune Pluto conjunction back in the 19th century and, um, and explore those from those themes. But just to speak about like, Gemini is the 10th sign from Virgo, Aquarius as the sixth sign from Virgo. Like how, how does that trine speak? And why is the 10th, the fifth of the sixth? That kind of brings me back to some of what we were just talking about. Like the 10th of our vocation, our visibility and our legacy, it should be the child of not just our daily, Right, because if it's just our daily toil, then we then the sixth is illness. If it is our sacred work, then the sixth is health. Mm -hmm. The child of the why I do what I do mm -hmm. is the what I do and how I'm seen doing it. Yeah, this is the concept that I brought up in in what we're talking about, which is like in the daily sacredness of life. Why do you do what you do? You know, if you're getting out of bed, what's your mission statement? And if you don't have a mission statement, this is a great time to get one. Why do you do what you do? Because if you just are up and about, that's a lot of wandering that is sometimes really delicious. But at this time when we're having, you know, this whole readjustment to the planet, like what's, what are you aiming toward? when you're getting out of bed in the morning. Because I tell you what, I don't know about other people's experience, but for me, if I have a purpose and I can aim and realign with that all day long, regardless of what's going on, I can make purpose-driven decisions. Do you know what I mean? Mm. And that's Those who wander are not always lost. No, but I don't. some of them are. <laughs> you know what I'm, I'm like, what the are you doing, you know? <laughs> Mm -hmm. You just talked to Gary Caton this week, right, about Mercury cycles and what I like to call the meta-Mercury cycles and the elemental year or years of Mercury, right? And I mean, I'm just assuming I didn't, I'm sorry to say I didn't hear that interview. Um, I'm talking too much to listen these days. Not always, <laughs> but too much, that's the case. But anyway, like knowing the truth of Mercury's dance with the sun from our point of view through the elements, mm -hmm. we've been in water mind world for okay. a year and a half and there's a little more to come. That's a long time. It's a long time in the human condition to be so in that, you know. I think at, at a collective level too, thinking about that, because we think about the different makeups of charts that are out there. Some people have been in their glory, right? They have been like, I'm living my best life. This is so good. And then there's everybody else who's like, this has been a long time in my emotions, in my home, in my past, in my, all of that to be sifting and shifting through as well on the bridge of, oh, we're just readjusting and changing our whole world. Yeah, the water is not the mind's like comfortable medium. Like I, I'm wearing the blue shirt down here. That's for the heart. <laughs> My mind wants to live up here in the air. Yeah. You know, and certainly that's not the only place that Mercury will thrive. Like there's a there's a beautiful there's thinking, intuition, and sensing and feeling and all that. And it's been a bunch of feeling because Mercury's retrogrades have all been water signs. At least the interior interior conjunctions all water signs for all of 2019 and all of 2020, including the Cancer cycle that we're in now and the Scorpio cycle to come. But this is a really cool like meta retrograde of the Mercury cycles that we move through the elements, what we consider in the chart is backwards retrograde because we'll move from the water like Scorpio to the air like Libra. And so Mercury is about to go into air signs starting next year, Aquarius, right? Will be the first one next year, I think. And um, yeah, and it's like, what, what's going to happen when we stop thinking with our hearts and start thinking with our minds? And look, that doesn't mean bad, right? There's a lot of spiritual training right now. Get out of your head and get into your heart. And of course, we do live in a paradigm that is so head focused, so much promoting that way, right? But 
the mind is a terrible thing to waste. The mind is a beautiful thing. And I, I really think that part of the path, solving it, coagula, the great alchemical axiom, break apart and put back together. It's like, let the mind do the mind. Mm -hmm. Let the heart do the heart. Like, you don't want to think what you're feeling. That's not feeling. Right. And you can let your thoughts be heartless in a sense, right? That doesn't mean evil. Like, think and feel and then bring those two worlds. So like if I'm on like a deep conspiracy, so-called conspiracy theory rabbit hole, which is one of my favorite places to play, like I don't bring my heart into that space anymore. I'm like, hey honey, like why don't you just like lay in this hammock over here? I'm gonna go check some shit out. I'll come back and, and, and the heart will be like, hey, what do you find? It's like, mm, I'm gonna tell you 10% of that stuff. Right. <laughs> Right. And, you know, by the way, <laughs> so when I'm like, and it's getting all scary, then my heart's like, hey, come home for dinner, sweetie. And my head's like, okay, cool. Right. Because like the heart, that's discernment, right? The heart will know like what is good and what is not. Mm -hmm. Right. Where the mind goes to look at what is right and what is wrong. Right. Yeah, and I think that we are in a time of just regardless of which way you go with it, and some of it can be seen as great, we're in a time of incredible like mob rule and mind think and just getting carried away in the tidal waves of it all. And this some of that, so I so in, in this question of when does it get better, one thing I think is a very important shift that is coming our way is mercury moving from these two years of water the other does four cycles the cycles are about 116 days or six in the same element and we're currently five out of six in the water and then we go into the air that's going to be a huge shift because it's going to be like whoa right that was a powerful dream <laughs> and now let's start interpreting it yeah there's a lot of emotional intelligence that's been built over these mercury cycles though, you know, cause it's had to kind of, I think come that way. And I think that mercury in water energies like that is strong in that way. You know, he's like, like passionate, caring, like we, it's not bad. Sure. Right? It's just a lot. It's just a lot. I mean, you want to see mercury just be at his finest, Put him in an air energy, truly, you know, and you're going to get a different experience. But I think this, this couple of years of real emotional intelligence and getting into that is also a piece as I think about all of the Aquarian and air stuff we're coming into is that part that keeps us human as well. So I don't think my way around your humanity and forget that we're, we're still humans in this together. Totally. Yeah. I love that we will be in a Scorpio Mercury cycle the way that I've come to do the cycles. I do them like Gary does. Um, so people can go listen to Gary and Stormy speak a couple of days ago um, to hear more about that or read Gary's amazing book, which is Hermetica Triptica, the part one. Um, in the Shamanic Astrology Mystery School, where I got my start, they do the cycles a little bit differently. I've now come and start with the interior conjunctions, which is what Carrie does. Um, yeah, I mean, we will be from that sense in a Scorpio Mercury cycle when Jupiter and Saturn make this big move into the air sign, starting with their Aquarius conjunction on December 21st, 2020. Mm -hmm. And that's a big deal, right? So that, you know, there's no answer to this question. It's more of a riddle and kind of poking fun, I think, of like, when does it end? When does it get better? Like, I can't give a date. I will say that Uranus trine uh, Pluto is a very intriguing um, suggestion as an answer to that question. There's in that, and we don't, certainly don't want to wait till 2026. That's ridiculous. But, <laughs> you're like, okay. it's you're almost there. Right? <laughs> 2026. And, yet, and yet we are. And I do think that we will be kind of knowingly on the other side of a lot of this apparent nightmare at that time. And I do think that it's going to get shakier between now and then for sure, personally. Sure. Um, but the the Jupiter-Saturn thing that's coming, right, we're not in that 
new moon phase or that visible Diana's bow thing yet. We're in Hecate's bow. We're like we're in the the elder stage of that cycle because Jupiter and Saturn last conjoined in the year of 2000, right? And have you laid down to, well, do you want to lay down the whole Jupiter Saturn element thing, Stormy, so people can be hip to that? Uh, which part of it for next? Well, that they move, or I, I guess I will just really quickly, the, the Jupiter Saturn conjunctions, they were called the great conjunctions back in the day because it stopped with what you can experience with your face. Right, so there wasn't Uranus and Neptune and Pluto and beyond. You know, Jupiter and Saturn were the slowest moving visible lights, the planetus, the wanderers. And Jupiter has about 12 years around and Saturn about 29 and a half. And Jupiter laps Saturn every 20 years, like clockwork. And so those were called the great conjunctions because this was like the long cycle, the moon and the sun being the shortest 29 and a half days. Actually, I guess moon Saturn would be the shortest, but anyway, um, you know, moon or Jupiter, Saturn, 20 years. And that was, there's a lot of socio-political happenings with those going down, regardless of what sign they are, maybe especially in Capricorn as we're experiencing now. And it's a pretty cool thing as we, you know, you and I, last time we connected, we were talking about visible astrology, like seeing it in the sky with your eyes and how Colorado is opening that, you know, that, amazing magic of the mysterious heavenly fabric for you and you know we go outside right now at sunset and there's jupiter and saturn and as we know jupiter just stationed direct which should start shifting us <laughs> we had every outer planet retrograde for three days after mars stationed on september 9th and then with jupiter stationing direct on september 12th we're starting to push it forward a little bit right Mm -hmm. uh, and then Saturn will go and, and a bunch of different planets will start moving forward and hopefully we do too. But you can watch them over the course of the next months like Jupiter's going to be chasing Saturn down and closing that gap and check out their conjunction like you won't see another one for 20 years, right? So there's this amazing truth of Jupiter in this part. If we want to compare this to the moon sun cycle, the lunation, Jupiter plays the part of the moon and Saturn of the sun right? Because Jupiter's moving much faster than Saturn. And so this is like Jupiter kind of in that very waning crescent phase until the conjunction on December 21st this year. And then something new is seeded. And in some senses, it's like much larger than the 20-year cycle. They last conjoined in the sign of Taurus in the year of 2000. And that was their last earth sign conjunction in our lifetimes because they do an 800 year cycle where 200 years are committed to the same element and they've been doing earth signs for 200 years now and we're moving into the air i mean interestingly and i think very importantly it's too often skipped over they had three conjunctions on new year's eve 1980 and twice in 1981 in the sign of libra right in fact, we had Jupiter, Saturn, and Pluto all in Libra then, just like we have them all in Capricorn now. So in a sense, the air, we maybe got a foreshadowing of it, or we shifted into it in the early 80s. Yeah. If we shifted into it then, then 2000 in Taurus was the Earth sign encore, right? <laughs> or it was maybe the preview of what's to come as we fully shift into the air, which is what most astrologers are talking about with this December 21st, 2020, first degree of Aquarius, Jupiter, Saturn conjunction, regardless in the tropical zodiac for the rest of our lives, Jupiter and Saturn will conjoin in air signs. And what do you feel about that shift from earth to air, Stormy? Yeah, I definitely feel like it's going to be this place where, like you said, we got the foreshadowing back there. And I think one of the biggest things we saw really was tech and obviously this change of thinking. Not so much, I don't want to push so much the humanitarian aspect of, of Aquarius, but just the mindedness of air in general, where there's just an ease and an access of information. But also at this timing, it's like, I feel like we're in a tear down to make space to have to, you know, before I feel like it was like an option in the eighties. It's like, here's an option, 
but a foreshadowing of how to connect with information and how to get more global in this time though as we come into it i don't feel like we're left with the option anymore now it almost feels like as we come into this era and we push this thing forward this will be the way right like we gave yeah, I mean, foreshadowing. in the 80s for example it was the advent of the personal computer right i mean it started coming into our homes and now like they are everywhere and we're all tapping and you and i are talking live from around the world <laughs> into all sorts Absolutely. of you know and of course gift and curse right i mean i'm very interested in personal computing we talked about this last time in the eclipse cycles well then came patriot act and now came these updates that aren't telling me that it comes with tracking me yada 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 um but of course this can be one of the great releases and while the earth is um dense the most dense it is the manifest right again not bad matter matters the air is very light and very fast very right fast. this stuff is moving faster than this water stuff and it's all moving faster than the cup yeah and importantly it's interesting that um, traditionally, and I know we're probably getting to time here, but um, Saturn is known as an Earth temperament planet, right? So cold and dry, where cold brings it down and dry separates. So stormy is stormy and bread is bread, you know, and <laughs> the way that Gary taught this to me, I really appreciate it. It's like grains of sand on the beach. Every grain's a grain, man. And then the water <laughs> comes in Gary. and that, right, and that thing becomes one mud. It's one clay, right? And so it's not individual grains. And that's the, that's the idea of wetness. It brings us together. Yeah. And Jupiter is known traditionally, it's interesting because people will think, well, Sagittarius fire and Pisces water, but J Jupiter is known as an air temperament planet, right? Which is um, hot and moist, like the, like the sunrise sky and the dew is still out, but it's getting warm and the energy of the spring. Jupiter lifts us up, right? And brings us together. And um, so interestingly, we could say Aquarius traditionally associated with Saturn, but unlike Capricorn, well, where they're finishing this Earth, 200 years of Earth, Aquarius is air. They're moving into this other place, which is mental. And, you know, I mean, I'm scared of the potential AI Terminator Skynet, like dystopian visions of you know mandatory vaccine robot world like, like that's not my happy place like i want to maintain my humanity as an earthling personally but there is something about um higher mind mm -hmm. that can open up i mean some people are like yo it's our space brothers and sisters coming in right maybe it's us literally through our technology aquarius like learning to see even more beyond the limits of our senses which is more of an earth thing well and i think we have to i mean you know the way that it it makes sense to me saturn and capricorn we're going to relook at the structures all of the things that i think are traditionally known with that saturn capricorn energy but when saturn gets into aquarius it's like cool we built the starbucks on all of our land or our coffee shop what do we do with the rest of the land? We've never seen it. We've never done it. We don't know enough, I think, to even perceive what could really be next. So the best we've got is to go to the past and pick out all the scary stuff, right? Because that's what humans do is we pick out all, all the bad stuff <laughs> first, right? Because we've just maybe never been this forced to be innovative, right? Like the last time, I mean, you know, we think about this, what, you got to be like 85 to have really seen the world get as different as it's about to get again, right? That's why, I don't know if you noticed this, but if you watch like the Google feeds and stuff like that, we got a lot of interviews going with people who are over 100 years old. First of all, the fact that they're alive is cool, but they're like, calm down. The world got different before and everybody's all right. You know, so and I, that's interesting, but I think that's super interesting because 
those people saw it. They saw the world be something it has never, was never even conceptualized to be before. And we're in that now. And so we're like, we don't even really know. We just know it's going to look way different. And hopefully it's not terrible and we all die. That's always the human, human way, I think. is like, hopefully it's not terrible and I die or I get hurt. Yeah, it's so, so, so important. I mean, and this, I think, is the great calling of this Capricorn Council, as I've been calling it, is like, mm -hmm. elder does not mean older, first of all, but older does mean elder if we're willing to listen, right? So in our culture, we've pushed the grandmothers and the grandfathers like into homes, right? And then we need somebody to step in and be that voice of wisdom. And sadly, that kind of vacuum, that kind of hole is going to get very unwise beings trying to step in and do what is the role of the Council of Grandmothers, right? Like, that's the true Capricorn, the, the elders, the ones who are preserving the true traditions. And it's so helpful, right? Again, like, for me to sit with folks who were really alive and that happening during the 60s, Right. And it's like, oh, I don't know. Like we were way into it. And then suddenly Bob sold the Bucky Dome and Big Sur and <laughs> shaved his ponytail. And uh, he's now he's a banker. I don't like, I don't know what happened, but like, well, what was happening? And then what happened? It's really important to hear. And then also like, I remember when I was so like, just, it, it, I was just in so much pain about what is the world now that I've opened my eyes beyond what I was trained to believe it was. And I needed those end of the world themes. So when 2012 wasn't that, there was like this comet that came around some years. I can't even remember what it's called now. And I was way into that. And I was talking to this uh, elder man, David Cates, a great teacher at, um, at a festival. And I was like, oh man, and there's this comet. And he's like, <laughs> he's like, what? And he's like, man, I, he's like, I did my last end of the world like 14 end of the worlds ago. Mm -hmm. like I'm just over it you know and I'm like what do you mean he's like there was this and this and this and we did this I was like I never heard of that he's like of course you didn't and nobody's going to hear about this comment you're talking about now because the world's not ending buddy and like why don't you start moving towards he's like do your thing whatever if that's it Bye. like cool sometimes we need to go into those scary places to choose to bring light back yeah and that can be what these trainings are about and maybe also what some of that mystical essence of Saturn even the Capricorn training is so maybe the last chart I'll show in this kind of turning of the wheel imagery is we're still in this cycle of Jupiter conjoined Saturn in 2020 mm -hmm. and if I look at the wheel the fabric of 12 through the eyes of the Taurus mysteries we get to find that all of the Capricorn beings actually let me go back to the new moon and we'll, we'll get to favor that beautiful new moon in Virgo and that perfect trine to retrograde Saturn Capricorn here. And, you know, what I like to say, I mean, this is a little too much for some, I think, in this languaging, but traditionally the ninth was called the house of God. It's like the ninth sign teaches us how each of the 12 prays. So if I'm on a study it's like what's rising in me is the Taurus mysteries. And I'm here to learn embodiment and the grace of Earth's pace. And that beauty is a spiritual practice and spirit is a beautiful practice. Like my passion's gotta be getting into the amazing, intricate, beautiful systems of Earth. And like the temple is how do things work? Mm -hmm. So when we look at the cycles and the seasons and, you know, for me, the earth signs, I like to say it's a trunk of the tree, Capricorn. It supports the thing. It's organic structure. It's rooted. And the Virgo is the leaf that's reaching for the light and doing the inner work that feeds the thing. But Taurus is the fruit and the flower and, you know, wants to be tasted and smelled and pollinated, which is just as necessary for the continuation of earth, you know? And so I think this is a really beautiful way to look at this chart to say, look, Capricorn's not just the 10th. It is when you look from Aries. It's not just like your job, right? It, it, what is the spirit of Capricorn? And to ask that question, look through the eyes of Taurus. Mm -hmm. And so for us to learn to slow down and find the presence of the moment now to unwrap that present 
there is high teachings in the spirit of the Capricorn mysteries, which does not look like as many of the books on my shelves would suggest the corporate CEO and the government and the police, right? We want to turn into the beautiful spiritual truth and gnosis of the elders and the voice of earth herself, right? And then that revelation will bring us towards the vocation of what Aquarius can be. So I think that in this dawning of the age of Aquarius, which you and I spoke about last time, or this image of Jupiter and Saturn aligning in that place, or maybe even the next Mercury air cycle starting in Aquarius or whatever, we want to be in our heart. We want to bring our emotional intelligence. So we're not, you know, that's a beautiful thing about Dr. Spock, right? He had this very high logical training, but supposedly he was wounded by his human half because he had feelings. No, he's not wounded. That's amazing. We want compassion. We want right. to make sure we don't go into this place where you can sit around some smoky table and decide dropping nuclear bombs is going to save lives, right? Like that's some crazy shit. We need, like I say, like, let the mind do the thinking, let the heart do the feeling, but make sure that they meet often, Yeah. right? And I think that it's a really beautiful truth now that this earth time is slowing us down, literally like very Saturnian that we've been put in a corner to think about what you did and what you want <laughs> to do. Very importantly, like, right, what is life truly about? What matters? Right. And start dreaming into a better existence, right? Mm -hmm. No, I mean, and, and with Aquarius, let's have the new abnormal. Because the old normal was whack. <laughs> the old you normal know? was whack. Well, so with all of this stuff, I know like we're super over time, but just in a you know, quick view, what do you think that this looks like for the United States going forward? Well, I mean, it, it is crazy. Like we know that in the U.S. chart, at least if we're looking at the 1776 revelation time, that this is Capricorn Pluto return. And many favor the Sagittarius rising chart for the states. And so that puts um, Capricorn on the second. And so some kind of financial ish, which certainly seems to be, you know, in the in the windshield, like ahead of us. Um, yeah. I think what a lot of people are sleeping on is that it's also the Neptune opposition of that U.S. chart. You know, it's a really interesting one. My friend Nancy Fisher turned me on to this. It is the heiress return of the Columbus so-called discovery. Well, but that's interesting because the United States, if we use the Sibley chart, would also be coming into its um, progressed balsamic phase. So to give birth to new whatevers. Right, and I mean, that's gonna happen re regardless of rising sign, right in that 70s, late 70s time frame. but where in the houses is it depends of course right. on the ascension. And, and I'd say we can look through all of the 12 eyes anyway, always, like we should. You get getting to know our charts from every one of the 12 places, right? Just turn your fifth into your ascendant and see what your kids see, right? Turn your seventh into your ascendant, see what the other sees. Um, I'm actually teaching a class on that coming up for WASA, for Washington State Astrological Association of turning the wheel and how that's not just about derived houses. Like, you know, we can turn the wheel to say, oh, where does your husband's second brother's wife's you know boss's cat live in your houses which is cool right but we can also say and i do this a lot with annual perfections right like so for example i'm in a ninth sign perfection until my birthday in october um so that's aquarius for me because i'm gemini rising and traditionally ruled by saturn who's in leo and my third so they says saturn's my time lord but importantly Leo is the seventh of Aquarius. So if the ascendant's perfected to Aquarius, now Leo is my seventh place and it's going to be a relational thing, right? And you really see that stuff speak. So I'm excited. I'm doing that and I'm doing a vocational signatures workshop. So 
Actually, I haven't put that up at GeminiBrett.com, but people can go to WA, W-A for Washington, astrologers.org and learn about the workshop. It's uh, October 8th and October 10th, respectively. Well, anyway, so sorry for a, for a plug that came in there. But yeah, looking at these things through the different eyes of the houses. So one really important thing about the USA chart that a lot of us somehow are sleeping on because Neptune is so sleepy is it's not only Pluto return, it's Neptune opposition. Mm, okay. Right? So the U.S. has the Virgo Neptune now with the Pisces Neptune opposing it. And again, all things Pluto are erratic. So creating a moment in such a way that the Pluto return will be synchronized to a Neptune opposition is a statement about that type of moment. And so there's going to be some delusion, I guess, with the Neptune opposition can be really foggy. You said that you're in your Pluto square now. Well, that's the one to come, right? So yeah. enjoy it. Um, but it's also like when the fog comes, we allow it to release ourselves from what we thought the land was, and we get to see a new place, a yeah. new light. Rejoice. And if we think of the um, Sag rising chart, well, that would have the 10th sign as Virgo, the fourth sign as Pisces. So there's some realignment at the roots, mm -hmm. Neptune in the fourth, realigning the spirit of the land to realign how, you know, the, 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 um, the roots so that the fruits and the branches can be renewed. And that for me is maybe the most beautiful promise of what's coming, like realigning again, like from the idea that our whole world is financial, that's bullshit, right? To coming back into values. Because a lot of that land of the free home and the brave shit, it sounded really cool in school. But when I look around, that doesn't seem to be what's going down. But that doesn't mean we should turn our back on it. Let's just actually do it for the first time. But that's going to happen only when we end the genocides and the racism, which of course is the blood on the hand of the so-called American enterprise, which maybe never can work because it started in such a shady space. Or maybe it can if we do some realignment and some healing and some forgiveness and some growth. And then I think, you know, what would it be if we choose for the fruits that we give to be these Virgo fruits of the priestess way of relying to spirit, you know? Yeah. So I'd like to see it be that truth. Yeah, I think there are many who would agree with wanting that to be the situation as well. I think I'm just fascinated by um, the United States right now in all of its little chart forms and everything that's happening, looking at it from many different lenses. And it's, I don't know, I just keep continuing coming back to this idea that I'm like, the United States better ask its elders how they made it through some things. If we're going to make it through some things. Yeah. And those, if we'll listen to those who have been through it, right? I mean, it's, you know how it is. You can't tell your kids what to do and what not to do. Like they're going to have to learn right. from their own happening. There's, there's no doubt about that. But at the same time, if they've heard it, they're going to get to the point of it all much faster. <laughs> and if we would just choose, and I think a lot of us are, if we would just choose to listen to those who have come before, those who have lived different experiences, right? Mm -hmm. And start to learn to look more through the eyes of the other. This is a really important thing. And so let's go a little full circle because last time we talked Stormy, I was talking about this moment of the solstice eclipse in 2020 and how powerful that is on, in the sacred hoop of stars and all of these things. Mm -hmm. Well, when we look at that chart for DC, Right. And in mundane astrology, we'll usually say what happens to the capital is happening to the country and its people. Notice that Pluto is culminating. The Jupiter-Pluto conjunction is culminating while Uranus is rising. Mm -hmm. so that's a mundane square. Right. And we see that in a map. It looks like this. So here's the, the Jupiter-Pluto at the midheaven with Uranus rising. And that is so strong in the DC chart, as we can see, 
And one thing, you know, it, it does say we, we want to be careful, want to like honor, think locally, act globally, right? That we've got a lot of countries tuning into this broadcast, even I'm sure. Um, and I think people can get a little upset that like people will be very focused in the States while we live here. But also this chart does show us to bring some of our attention there. And if you look, for example, like at the local space lines, which I just love, I just taught a course about this for Kepler. Well, Neptune's head into Portland, right? But the, the eclipse itself goes to Jacksonville, which of course is named for Andrew Jackson, who drove the Trail of Tears from this in many places. Um, but if you look at like uh, Eris, for example, going through Oklahoma, Neptune and Mars going up towards the Black Hills, like, you know, the Lakota sacred lands here towards um, Fort Laramie, literally where these false treaties were signed. And, I, and you know, we can see things more globally too, like um, Saturn, for example, is connecting Washington DC with Beijing. Uh, like literally see that line goes right through Beijing. It's emanating from DC, that local space line. So we see a little bit about the world politic between these countries and systems right now. But one thing that I've really had my heart lifted by and my hope reinstated by and my the reminder that I should be in my faith is seeing some of the great changes, even though slow, that are ha happening for returning our ears to the native way, right? The wisdom of this land where I live. And, you know, some of it just like they were really important, like a Supreme Court decision by a Trump appointed dude, actually, that kind of favored, um, the tribal, right? Like the tribal land of Oklahoma. There were things that happened, even if it was just in protest against that dude in the Black Hills, when he went to Mount Rushmore, which should be six grandfathers. That's what it was always called for the directions. You know, the Washington football team is now called that. Wow. Instead of the Redskins, right? Like we've been one in that one for since the beginning or should have. And now it's cool, you know, people actually suggested different like new names they could take on. They're like, right now they're just like nameless. And I think that's really powerful. So I actually, I would love for that to be a reminder for me at this time. And you know, like, what if we just allow ourselves to not have a name, not have a mascot, not need to grab an animal card, like be in this moment and see what comes in. Mm -hmm. Become something we haven't seen before, maybe. In every way, personally, globally. That's all right. That's all right. And it starts here, right? Oh man, well we like totally killed it. We talked about a lot of stuff on the internet today. <laughs> And this year's second time. <laughs> so I'm, I'm really excited to go over to your channel and check out a lot of these things. Like just looking up for the lineup for this week. I'm like, oh my gosh. Yeah. Um, so yeah. Our Stormy, friend. thank you for having me on in yeah. your zone. It's really nice to connect with you. Yeah. Thanks for coming. It's always like, I feel like you leave and then I have to go think about all of life and all of astrology for like two hours and like learn everything you just said, which is always a nice feeling for me. I am a researcher at heart. So to find out the next thing, that's actually something I was laughing about with Gary um, when he was here and, and Adam Gainsburg when he came is that I said, at the end of last year, I was like, you know what? I think where I'm at is I would love to have a better reunion with the sky and get sky teachers. And then I, I feel like the luckiest person because I got all three of you guys. I was like, ha, I'll know that damn thing in no time. <laughs> Next year, I'm hoping to have my video course like up and out. I've been teaching for Organization for Professional Astrology recently because yeah. like beautifully they've added astronomy as like mandatory. And I'm not teaching like the how to calculate a chart with tables as astronomy. I'm like, when you go outside and you watch the planets do this, what is that in a chart? And actually, there's a lot of kind of weird contradictions, you know. Yeah. Um, and Gary and, and Adam with Julene Packard Lewis um, and Andrea Kennedy, like the Sky Astrology Conference folks, Shamanic Astrology Mystery School, where I got my start. There's a lot of us who are really tuning more and more. And I, I think that this is part of Uranus in Taurus, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Of like 
bringing the heavens into the more embodied experience. So I'm stoked that to hear that that's part of your calling. I know when we talked last, you were like, I'm here with dark skies and it has changed the way that I, yeah. that I astrologize. I've seen that happen for so many people. And yeah, let's look at that Virgo rising chart, like through that lens. Well, what is the ninth sign, but Taurus, mm -hmm. right? So for Virgo, who I believe is on a path of learning the sacred geometry and the fabric of nature and how all the pieces interconnect and the cycles and the seasons and that body mind side of Mercury, that Hermes side of Mercury, you know, then the way we pray a Taurus, like it's about the beauty and the embodiment and all of that. So to get really passionate fifth Capricorn, you know, about the study of beauty and sensuality is going to bring me more into an experience of the intricate fabric of nature. So just to give you something to fuel your two hours then, um, take a chart like this. I really love Astro Gold software. It lets me let's just do this. And it gives me the 12 whole sign versions of a moment. Sweet. Right. And then I can say, oh, well, this is Mars is in the 12th of Aries and Venus is in the uh, second of Taurus and Mercury is in the second of Gemini and the moon is in the first of Cancer and the sun is in the 12th of Leo. So both Mars is in the 12th of Aries and the sun is in the 12th of Leo. What's that about, you know? And it's a really cool way to explore natal charts. It's like the, the tradition thing would be oh, can a planet see the signs it governs and how does it see it? But if you do this with a natal chart, sometimes it'll be like 77755 And you're like, wow, even though this person doesn't have a really packed seventh house, the way the planets relate to the signs that they govern is all relationship based. Yeah. And so it's this hidden truth that this soul is so devoted to relationship or something. So that's what I'll be teaching for the turning of the wheel with annual perfections coming up. So <laughs> people want to check that out. Eventually I'll have it up on my website. I should do that now, which is GeminiBrett.com. But you can also go to WA, WA for Washington, astrologers.org and find out about the coming turning of the wheel and uh, vocational signatures in the needle chart. So three crows chasing a gigantic red-tailed hawk right outside my window. So Sometimes you gotta do it. Sometimes you gotta, gotta just do, do it. <laughs> Good one. All right, Stormy, sure. thank you. And I'll make sure all your info's under the video, especially once I post it on YouTube, so people can find you, find where you'll be at in this next weekend, a uh, couple weekends, and all that good stuff. Right on. It's a treat to connect. And um, I hope folks who on my place, like who just heard Stormy, maybe go over to her page. She's, she's doing this every week. <laughs> so it's like four this week. So there's so much amazing astrology. And thank you for bringing that grace, Stormy. So and for holding it down, I saw the bass clef on your wrist. You know, that's the job. Yes. Keep it steady. Got it. Right. Yeah, good. All right, you guys. Well, we will see you. Man, we'll see you on Monday. Are we going to see you on Monday? No, we're going to see you on Tuesday when Rick Levine will be here. And we are going to talk very specifically about 2021 and the Saturn and Uranus squares as they are happening multiple times throughout 2021, what that looks like going forward, what it's looked like in the past. So we'll have an exploration of that. And Rick will probably say things that are inappropriate and it will be wonderful. <laughs> so we will see you guys on Monday. Bye, everybody.